name is Luke and I'm now 20 years old, but this story, it took place when I was 17. So, at this experience, I'm still pretty perplexed by it, but it gives me chills to this day. In May of 2017, I found myself going out a lot more on my mountain bike. I was just getting bored of cruising around the streets too, so I wanted to go for like a trail or woodland bike ride. I had never been to Lay Woods before then, and personally I don't think I'll ever be going alone again, but after some research into a few different areas, Lay Woods seemed to be my best bet. Living only a couple of miles away, it was a pretty nice bike ride. On arrival, it looked really peaceful and I was almost in a dreamlike state by my first look at the place. For a woodland area in England, let alone Bristol, it was pretty much amazing. On going into the woods, I remembered seeing different colours at the start of each trail, sort of signifying difficulty for bikers and length for walkers and whatnot. Don't take my word for it though, because I still really don't know what they meant. But I decided to go down a coloured, I can't remember very well, I think it was blue, trail, to see how it was there. Finding it exciting, I decided to go down the harder trail and here's where it starts to get a little bit weird. So I began getting this weird feeling and I began looking around as if I was being followed by the woodlands itself. Everything all of a sudden felt like it was getting bigger and further away too, which was weird. But I brushed it off and it turns out that I actually completely lost track of time. I got lost on the trail too, but bear in mind, I'm very observant and aware of my surroundings before this trail. But I then came to a sort of strange opening. I could go left into this rough direction of the way out or right deeper into the woods, I think. Me being me, I decided to just go deeper into the woods. I came to a sort of weird little trail that just had dodgy written all over it. I went against my gut feeling of turning back and went down there. I came to a point of which the trail continued, but it was actually getting pretty dangerous. The trail being too bumpy for me to even walk down, I eventually just turned back. But for a few minutes before turning back, I don't know why, but I was just sort of stood still staring down the trail. I just felt like I was being watched from all angles, even though it would be near impossible to have done that. Anyway, I got nervous and began walking back up the hill as I was too tired to ride at this point. But keep in mind too, my bike tires are completely solid, no punctures, slow punctures, or even anything wrong at all. I wish I still had pictures of the bike too, but anyway, upon getting back to the spot where I originally went to the trail, this weird loss of time thing happened. It felt as if the whole path had stretched by like half a mile, as if the woodland was moving or something. I began walking up the path, feeling that same eerie sensation of being watched as I did beforehand. But this time, it felt a bit more sinister. It felt as if something was about to happen. Bearing in mind, I hadn't seen a single person at this point in time since I went down that first trail. I'll explain the scenery though before continuing. So, it's a long path, a slight steep hill to my left, a very narrow river to my right. Maybe four feet deep, maybe four feet wide as well. There's bushes on either side of the river with the odd tree every now and then. And upon getting about maybe a quarter of the way up the slowly inclining path, I... Then, all of a sudden hear a woman crying from behind a tree up ahead. I start slowing down my walking pace to try and get a good look behind the tree, but the whole time I'm thinking to myself, why would someone jump across to cry behind a tree? So I edge closer to the river to look behind to see if the person is okay. Also because many people go to Lay Woods to end their lives and such, so I was hoping maybe to help this person or something. But you guessed it. When I got there, there was no one there and the crying just suddenly stopped. A bit weirded out by this, obviously. I just sort of slowly turn away and I start walking again. A bit quicker now as I was pretty unnerved. I've had paranormal experiences before, but never in a place like the woods like this. It's usually in a house or some sort of a building or something and... 
Definitely never anything as uh, acute as that, I suppose. So this whole thing was really new to me, and I had this sudden shiver, though, as I was walking, and maybe a minute or so later, only a couple of meters away from where I had heard the crying, it started up again. But this time, it was right opposite me across the river. I didn't bother looking this time. I started to go into a bit of a jog, and as I got faster, I heard the bushes rustling as if they, or whatever it was, was following me. Upon hearing this, I quickly sped up, and the crying became more and more hysterical. Bear in mind, too, that my bike was fine before this moment in time. I thought to myself, you know what? Screw this. I'm gone. So I went to hop onto my bike with the adrenaline that was rushing through me and I came to an almost sudden stop. My back tire on my bike had become completely flat all of a sudden, so I had no other choice but to just sprint with my bike and pray for the best that I don't trip up or end up having to throw it to run faster or something. With the crying person still close to me and keeping up, I'm running faster and faster praying that I get off this path that I was on. I was almost in tears at this point because I couldn't actually do anything to help the situation or get out of it faster, but after what felt like, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes of running, I could finally see the car park. The crying had stopped following me and getting closer and sort of started moving back to where I first heard it, I think. I wasn't about to hang around to find out though, so I sprinted out into the car park. I must have been as white as a sheet of paper and hysterical with my breathing and wheezing because multiple people in the car park turned to look at me like I was crazy. I saw the exit sign out of the car park and I just ran towards it. But while doing so, I noticed that my bike it was moving a lot smoother all of a sudden. I stopped to take a quick look and I could hardly believe it, but my bike tire it had suddenly regained all of its air and it was solid again as it was before the unnerving crying person shenanigans. I jumped off my bike and I got away from those woods as fast as I could and since then I, I've never been back. But the thing that makes this really scary is that I have Irish heritage and in Irish folklore there's a demon woman called the Banshee. She's apparently seen in woodlands next to rivers and lakes washing blood off of clothes. It's said that if you see her washing blood off of clothes, the person who owns those clothes will die. Alternatively, if you hear her crying, it means death apparently. I can't remember the meanings exactly of the deaths, but it means either you or a loved one will die, I think. Anyway, I don't know about all of that, but since 2017, I have lost my auntie and two of my best friends, and a dog as well, in a sort of streak of bad luck, I suppose, but... I can't help but think about this when I reflect on it all. Lay Woods is no joke, that's for sure. There are many stories that have come up out of those woods. You can read online about them if you want. All you have to do is search up Bristol Haunting and Lay Woods and stuff like that and it should come up. Apparently it's rated like the 87th most haunted place in the UK according to some places. Anyway, like I said, I haven't been back there ever since, and I'm not planning to, and I hope that you enjoyed the story. This happened around nine years ago, when I was just 13 years old. Before I tell you what happened, though, I think it would be good for you to understand the layout of my former house. We moved out after this. So... Imagine the letter T and the inverted version of it, then join them together at the vertical line. The vertical line is the hallway and there are two rooms at the top facing each other, and at the bottom there is one bedroom and the bathroom facing each other, and there's my room between them facing the hallway. Now, I had always had a bit of a sleeping problem growing up, so I was wide awake at 3am like normal. I was watching the dark hallway like I usually do when I couldn't fall asleep. But on this particular night, I was more restless for some reason and felt like something was wrong. The feeling of uneasiness sat in the pit of my stomach for quite some time. It was like I was waiting for something horrifying to happen and it was inevitable. Anyway, while my unease was getting stronger and stronger and I could feel pain stemming from dread, 
I suddenly saw my mum walk out of the bedroom and towards the bathroom area. I must admit that when I saw her, I was overcome with relief too. I even heard the noise of the bathroom door handle. It was old and loose, so it made a bit of a sort of jingling sound. I got up and out of bed to talk to her so that I could thankfully calm myself down. But when I walked past the door frame and saw that the bathroom area was completely empty, I just sort of stood there frozen in place. Words can't even describe the horror that I felt, but I had goosebumps all over my body. I also felt like cold water was just splashed down my head. And I stood there, unable to turn my back to the dark hallway and glanced at the bedroom. And there I saw my mum and my dad sleeping peacefully, unaware of what had just happened. Somehow I found the strength to walk back to my bed, got under the covers while shaking from fear. I don't even really remember falling asleep. Maybe I passed out from fear or something. I don't know, but to this day, even after nine years, I'm sure what I saw was identical to my mum. Her curly and shiny black hair was what made me feel sure that it was my mum. But what I failed to realize was that my mum didn't have a completely white set of pajamas. And whoever that was, that's what they were wearing. This is just one of the many things that happened to me and my family in that house. And it's not even limited to that place too. It's like something always follows me. Even my sister witnessed it happening two or three times too. I have no idea what's going on. I have no idea who that was or what even happened that night. Whatever it was though, it really scared me. So I started dating my girlfriend at the end of my senior year. And before we started dating, I used multiple dating apps. In many of my dating app profiles, I had my Snapchat listed so that people could add me. This is important too, but nothing led to anything within the dating apps themselves. I would talk to people for a bit and eventually the conversation would just die out. When I began dating my girlfriend, I had deleted the apps but never really deleted my account, meaning that people could still see my profile and my Snapchat in it. I realized this only after a few people would add me, but it didn't go anywhere because I would tell them that, well, I had a girlfriend. As you would imagine, too, the conversation would pretty much always end there. But there was this one guy that added me. His name was Adam, and he asked me if I was available. Being straight, I was used to guys adding me, so I gave him the usual response of, sorry, I'm straight, and I actually have a girlfriend. And honestly, I sort of expected him to just leave me alone, but he didn't. At first, the messages were fairly normal, like, how was your day? What did you do today? Simple stuff like that. But being the nice guy that I try to be at least, I responded because I thought that this guy just wanted to be friends, and having a gay friend is alright by me. But then the messages, though, they progressively got more and more creepy, like, he started asking me questions about my girlfriend and not the basic questions. Questions like, do you guys make out a lot or does she like you in bed? I simply responded with, those are kind of personal questions, dude. And I don't feel like it's right for me to share my dating business. Adam would always apologize and he wouldn't talk to me for a few days after that. But then he would hit me up again and ask some more creepy questions. I eventually told my girlfriend about the situation too, and while my girlfriend is super sweet, she's also very aggressively protective over me. So she adds this guy and basically tells him that he needs to leave me alone. Unfortunately though, this seemed to enrage Adam, who responded with saying that I needed to dump this girl now because, well, expletives. Naturally, I defended my girlfriend and blocked Adam, and everything was pretty cool for a week. Until another account added me. The guy's name was Tyler and he was super chill. He was really nice to me and respected my relationship with my girlfriend. As the days go by, I start to notice that Tyler's vocabulary was actually very similar to Adam's. I wasn't sure about it though, so I didn't make any assumptions that it actually was him. 
So I gave Tyler's snap to my girlfriend, who adds him to investigate. And as soon as she adds Tyler's snap, Tyler flips out at her, which confirms that it was Adam. As soon as this realization is made, though, I, I block him again. From here, though, everything goes quiet from Adam for probably about a month, I would say. So, I live in the suburbs of Chicago, and both my girlfriend and I live down the street from each other. Naturally, we do see each other a lot, and both our families are really good friends. On top of that, our families would also house sit or pet sit for each other from time to time. And anyway, a month goes by until I get a letter with no address or name on it. Just my name in the front. I open it, and to my shock and horror, it's basically a, a love letter from Adam. The premise of the letter was basically him saying that he loves me and he wants me to run off with him. The letter also takes a, a very sexual turn halfway through with him describing what he wants to do to me and vice versa. And at this moment, two horrifying realizations suddenly hit me. One is that he knows my address. And two, he dropped that letter off himself, meaning that he is in my town. Well, I immediately called my girlfriend, who was equally as shocked as I am, and after consulting with my parents, we eventually called the cops. Unfortunately, since I had blocked as well as removed Adam's social media information, and that the letter had no return address, there was really nothing that we could do about it. But, day after day, letters would keep appearing in my mailbox until they also started appearing in my girlfriend's mailbox as well. Her letters were way worse than mine. Adam wrote of how much he hated her and how much he wanted to like hurt her and stuff. He also started stating many times of the ways he would inflict pain upon her until she broke up with me that is. Just like me too she took this to the cops and again though they couldn't really do anything about it. My girlfriend's family had plans to go to Hawaii for a vacation though and I was actually going to house sit for them. And the first couple of days went pretty much without event. Until around maybe one or the last nights of the week. I can't exactly remember, but as per usual, I was over at their house just watching TV on the couch when all of a sudden the power went out. Mind you, it's like around 1 a.m. and it's pitch black when those lights went out. The next few seconds were silent, but then I heard a a window smash from the office. To understand this a little better too, let me quickly give you a layout of the house. So, when you entered the front door, to your left was the living room, straight ahead was both the kitchen and the stairs, and to the right was the office and the dining room. On the upstairs level, as soon as you reached the top of the stairs that is, my bathroom was straight ahead and my girlfriend's room was on the right, and the other bedrooms were on the left. So, immediately I shot up and grabbed a kitchen knife. I ran upstairs to hide while I called the cops. I quickly got into my girlfriend's room and slipped into the closet. And as soon as I was able to contact the operator, I heard the pounding of the intruder running up the steps. Thankfully, I had relayed all the information to the operator in time, who then stayed on the phone as we both remained quiet. The intruder took a left when he reached the top of the stairs, which gave more time for the cops to arrive and for me to get ready just in case I needed to defend myself. A few minutes go by until I heard the intruder start walking toward my girlfriend's room. In the only few precious seconds that I had, I slipped out of the closet and positioned myself next to the door. And as soon as he opened that door and started to enter the room, I took the kitchen knife and went straight for his shoulder. A young man screamed in pain as I heard a heavy metallic object make a large thud as it hit the ground. From there I bolted out of the house where I was met by four squad cars and cops with their guns raised. I quickly threw my hands up shouting that he was upstairs in the right room. A few minutes go by and the intruder was eventually dragged out, still screaming in pain. With the siren lights flooding the street, I got a glimpse of this guy's face and it was Adam. I was informed later by an officer too that the metallic thud that I heard, it was actually a handgun that he had dropped. Adam was from Texas and had traveled up to my state to be with me apparently. He had rented a room at a local motel and would put letters in both my girlfriend's and my mailboxes daily. 
He would do this in the early hours of the morning, which was confirmed by the security footage of the motel that he was staying at. That night, Adam, he actually had plans to kill my girlfriend and her family, so I would apparently choose to be with him. He had managed to pry open the power box, then switch off the power to a house along with the neighboring houses, and broke in with the intent of her being there. Well, unfortunately for him, she was enjoying a tropical vacation. To be honest, I have no idea how this outcome would be different if they didn't go on vacation. Maybe they would have stopped him, or maybe something else would have happened. I don't know, but... I'm grateful that I still have my girlfriend as well as her family alive. And also, I'm very grateful that Adam is now locked up. My wife and I travel pretty often city to city, and at one point we settled down in Vegas for a few months. There was one night too where we were arguing after work about something headed towards Henderson, city outside of Vegas, lots of isolated streets out that way too. I was sitting reclined back in the passenger seat when we ran over something and the tire definitely popped. My wife got out to check and confirmed and within seconds a woman in a very nice car pulls up behind us. I saw that she was a woman and I laid back in the seat still mad, still stubborn and figuring that she was just checking on my wife assuming that she was alone. The woman said that she had a brother-in-law with a tow truck. He could definitely tow the car free of charge to a shop. My wife asked why she was being so kind and she said something like, Our sister's got to stick together. I'm helping you out. She then got back in the car and my wife told me that she was going to follow us with her hazards on to this empty and dark parking lot in front of some grocery store, apparently nearby to get us out of the road. I still didn't think it was weird at all. My wife was very confident that this woman was genuine and just really wanted to help us. So we pull into the parking lot and my wife gets out. I'm still laying back and this woman doesn't even know that I'm here yet. She starts talking to my wife about how she changed her life within a year. But she could put her on to what she does. It seems believable to be honest. She looks really nice and her car was definitely expensive. My wife keeps insisting that she could just call a tow truck. She felt bad that she was taking her time, but we could afford it. But this woman, she just kept insisting that her brother-in-law was coming. Be patient. He really doesn't mind. She even offered at some point to drive my wife around the area looking for a shop that was open, but my wife had already googled some places. She told her that's smart and they kept talking. No suspicion, honestly. But she then starts asking my wife why she's in Vegas. We had New York plates. She says for adventure and doing something new and blah blah blah. The woman asks if she has family she's close to or maybe a boyfriend. She could introduce her to some friends to help her get well acquainted or something like that. She motions over to me and says, well I have a husband. And this woman, she honestly looked like a deer in headlights. I politely waved. She leans over and finally sees me, stares for a few seconds, and then just immediately gets in her car, instantly. I've never seen anyone look at me like that too, like she had to get away from me or something. She tells my wife that she has to go to a store that's opening soon. Her brother-in-law is taking too long, but he'll be there in like an hour at least. She told her not to leave, that he was going to come and help, well, one hour. My wife was really confused and tried to ask if she'd be there too, but the woman just drove off. We knew then that something was wrong too with that situation, and we both just sort of stared at each other in confusion. I have no idea still why that happened, but we called a towing company and fixed the car within like 40 minutes, drove back to wait because my wife was persistent in believing that this woman was going to come back, or her brother-in-law would, and... She wanted to let them know that she didn't need their help. I told her that I really don't think that they're coming back, but we did wait. No one came to for like nearly two hours before we drove home, and I did some research and found out apparently a lot of traffickers use women because they seem more trustworthy. 
Vegas obviously has a large presence of these things as well. And the woman was almost desperate to keep my wife there for some reason. It was all just really weird and gave me some really creepy vibes, that's for sure. These days when I look back, it seems more obvious that there was danger there, but in the moment, the woman was just so charming and endearing that it seemed like she was genuinely trying to help. To be honest, I, I'm still not 100% sure what happened that night, but I'm pretty sure that she ran off because I was there, and she didn't anticipate a man being. I used to live in a fairly small town where there wasn't really much to do as a teenager. One of the things that I learned to enjoy from my parents was visiting antique stores and looking at all of the interesting old things. My senior year of high school, I went to this large antique store or sort of flea market and I came across a Ouija board that was probably from the 70s or the, maybe the 80s I would guess. I was a pretty skeptical agnostic I guess you could call me at the time and thought that it would be a bit of fun to sort of do it with friends. And nothing really crazy happened except that I had my first instance of sleep paralysis around that time. The next year though I went to college and I brought it with me and my friend and I convinced some girls from his dorm to try out the Ouija board in a small cemetery on campus with the old landowners from like the early 1800s. That night, I stashed the board under my bed and I went to sleep like normal. But as I was dozing off, I kept seeing images of like skulls flying towards me. Almost like in that pre-dream, in-between, awake and asleep visual state, if you've ever experienced that. Anyway, I woke up suddenly from a nightmare around 3am and had the strangest feeling of being sort of partially paralyzed and then sort of released. It's hard to describe how I know this, but it felt as if there were like two long arms that lifted off of me and went under each side of my bed. It really creeped me out and I looked under my bed and, and I remembered that the Ouija board was down there and so I didn't want to be alone. I was going to go to the 24-hour campus library. As I was leaving, my neighbor from across the hall came out of his room and I told him about the experience and... He said that he would be willing to walk around the room with a picture of the Virgin Mary that was supposedly blessed by a holy man in Mexico. Obviously, I was a bit wary of that, being skeptical and agnostic like I was, but I figured, you know what, it couldn't hurt since I was so creeped out. Next day, I gave the board to that neighbor. I was glad to be rid of it, to be honest, and eventually I just forgot all about it. A couple of years later... I was in a bar with some friends though when who should I see but my old neighbor. After we caught up a bit, he said, hey, do you remember that Ouija board that you gave me? Yeah, well, I took it back home and I gave it to my mum, and she said that some weird things like lights turning on and off and hearing voices had been happening ever since she got it and eventually she actually burned it. That was weird to say the least and Upon reflection, that year of my life when I had that board was actually a pretty bad year. Obviously, I'm still pretty skeptical, but more open-minded about the supernatural after this experience, for sure. And I guess that's why I definitely don't want to be playing with any more Ouija boards. So I'm a clinician in a psychiatric hospital. I work with all kinds of people. I diagnose them by doing an assessment. And essentially I find out why they're seeking help. I've always heard tales too of schizophrenics somehow being sort of privy to a different world through their hallucinations. But before I get to that, let me back up a bit. So I've read that schizophrenics can see our world in the layers that we cannot. I'd never believed it, until I had a few experiences, one in particular too. Before I was a clinician, I was a mental health tech. I looked after patients and put them in physical holds when they were endangering themselves or others. And one day, this guy Aaron, who had been fine all week, suddenly began responding to internal or external stimuli. He ran out of his room and broke a microwave, screamed like a banshee, and went into his room. 
I went into his room where he leaped at me from a chair. He grabbed my shirt and said, Okay, I'm going to wear your body and we'll drive your car too. When I'm done with your body, I'll cover it in leaves. I calmly removed his hands from my neck and shoulders and I escorted him into a safe room, which is what it sounds like really. A room where only he resides and we keep an eye on him with a camera. But as he sat on the bed, he suddenly blurted out, you haven't talked to your dad in six years and you have a brother who is missing in California. And at that, my blood instantly ran cold and I became sort of lightheaded because I really hadn't talked to my dad in like six years. And yes, my brother was missing, presumably in California somewhere. To say that I was a little spooked is a bit of an understatement. So... Uh, I recently uh, heard of this book called An Amazing Journey into the Psychic Mind that deals with the phenomenon of auditory and visual hallucinations. I haven't read it yet, but every schizophrenic that I've come across tells me, when they want to that is, about hearing a voice. It can give commands and come from the television or a radio or just continuously play in their head. It can tell them that no one likes them and all sorts of other things. Or it can... Say some really strange things like, no one likes you, your pants are terrible, no one loves you because, well, your pants are foolish, stuff like that. This book, though, apparently looks at the world of these hallucinations and wonders if these hallucinations are actually a negative entity alive somewhere in the world that is tormenting certain people. I don't know if I believe this, but I've been privy to psychotic people saying things to people that they should really not be able to know and so all of this has my interest peaked and I guess I just wanted to share this story because it's something that stuck with me ever since it happened. When I was around 12 years old my family and I moved into a semi-detached house just up the street from our previous home. The house wasn't very big and the floor plans for our part of the house were completely different from our neighbours. But our neighbours were a lovely little family of four. Husband is from England, wife is from Norway which is where I live. They also had a little three year old girl and a six month old boy. Now I actually really like children, always have and at the time I really wanted to start babysitting. It's quite common to start babysitting at about age 12 here and I was turning 13, about a month later anyway, so I wanted to find a small job. As we got to know our neighbours over the first few months of living there, my parents told the neighbours that if they ever needed a sitter, then it would be nice if they would consider trying me out. Seeing as it would be my first job as a babysitter, we thought it would be smart to start with my next door neighbours, seeing as my parents would literally be on the other side of the wall, just in case anything happened cut to a Friday night when my neighbours went to a party that was happening just down our street. I got there at around 8pm and the parents told me that they would come home at around 2 or 3am. Both kids were already sleeping so they told me to just put on a movie and just relax. Now these kids were honestly the easiest to babysit ever. Once you put them to bed and they fell asleep, literally absolutely nothing would wake them up. They really were some of the heaviest sleepers that I've ever seen, so babysitting them was usually pretty uneventful. I was on the couch watching Avatar in the living room on the second floor. The kids had their own separate bedroom that was just downstairs where the front door was. I could basically see their bedrooms from where I was sitting as the place was quite small. But because of the hallway, I couldn't quite see the front door. Now, again, this house was very small, so... As long as the TV wasn't up too loud, I could hear everything that happened downstairs. And at around midnight, I heard the front door unlock and my neighbours walked in whilst talking. I hear them close the door and they started taking off their jackets and shoes. I thought it was a bit weird that they hadn't called to let me know that they were coming home early. I just assumed that it must have slipped their minds though. So I went downstairs to greet them. I could hear them talking up until the point that I came around the corner to the hallway that led to the door, and when I did, there wasn't anybody there. The talking fell silent the second that I turned the corner, and the only sound was from the TV upstairs. 
My heart started beating quickly and my head was rushing down. I ran to the bedrooms and checked the kids before I searched the rest of the house. I opened every door, checked every cabinet for anything that could explain what had just happened. But honestly, there was just nothing there. The kids were still sound asleep as well and eventually I just convinced myself that I must have been imagining things. I did check the kids one last time and I made sure that the doors were wide open so that I could see them from upstairs. Eventually I sat down to finish the movie whilst trying to process what had just happened. But when I sat down I noticed the TV had been shut off even though I hadn't turned it off. And when I turned it back on, there was just snow on the screen. I couldn't for the life of me get it to work again as well. And that was when the talking downstairs started up again. But not only that, but the baby started screaming bloody murder. Now, this baby never woke up from naps and definitely never screamed the way it did that night. I've never in my life run down a staircase as fast as I did that night though. I rushed towards the baby's bedroom only to find the door closed. I ripped the door open, picked up the baby, and rushed to pick up his sister. I took them both upstairs and held those kids for almost three hours before, finally, the parents came back home. The talking and the sounds downstairs came and went as I had the kids with me on the couch. I held them as close to me as I possibly could, and I just tried my best to keep them asleep. As the parents came home, I was too scared to walk downstairs to greet them. I couldn't be sure if it was actually them or not until they walked up the stairs and just found me clutching their children upstairs. Obviously, they noticed that I was upset and asked me what had happened. I honestly felt like I had lost my mind at that point, but I just told them the story anyway. After I was finished, they told me that it wasn't the first time that anything like that had happened there, because apparently they had heard voices all the time at night as well. I was kind of mortified that they didn't think to warn me before, but they said that they were sorry that this happened to me, and the mum walked me home to my house eventually. And after that, I slept with the lights on in my room for almost a month after it. And believe it or not, I did actually go back, and I did babysit those kids once again. Growing up, I had a childhood friend that lived relatively close by, and honestly, we were like two peas in a pot. We both were adventurous, believed in the paranormal, enjoyed astronomy, and generally just being outside. She was born in Alaska, and her dad lived there for quite a while, so they were always into camping, hiking, fishing, skiing, you name it. And it was with my friend's family that I got introduced to fishing, and I did a lot of camping as well. This happened during the mid to late 90s and I would say that we were maybe around 10 to 12 years old at the time. It's been a while though so I can't really remember exactly. In one camping trip we went to this lake in the forest that was surrounded by a meadow and feeding the lake was a small stream leading out of the woods. We played in the meadow and the stream pretty much all day while my friend's dad fished. The lake wasn't very big, and because it had a meadow all around it, he could keep an eye on our whereabouts while he fished. While messing around the stream, the wooded area that it was coming from gave me a really weird vibes though. I can't explain it, but I just felt really uneasy. Anyway, the day faded away into early evening, and it was time to leave and find a camping spot. My friend's dad packed up his fishing gear and we all walked back to the truck on this long winding path through the woods. Once in the truck, we drove into a more remote area of the forest and made our way up this steep road that was so rough and at such an incline that I was convinced that my friend's dad was going to break his truck. He had a four, maybe six cylinder Toyota pickup or something that was about as basic as a truck could get. In fact, I'm not even that sure if the truck even had four wheel drive. Being an Alaskan outdoorsman with years of experience, I just sort of trusted him. We finally made it up to the top though, which was flat and relatively open with a big area of forest in the opposite direction from the road that we drove up. We pitched our tents, got everything set up, and my friend and I decided to go and explore the area. We were maybe 50 yards from the tent when 
But we heard a big crack as a tree branch snapped in the woods behind us. Well, we got quiet and looked in that direction, but we didn't see anything. Thinking that it was just a deer, though, we ended up just brushing it off. As we were walking, we heard it again and whispered to one another about what it could be, but kept going. It stopped briefly, and when we were about maybe 200 yards from our campground, we sat on a boulder looking down the steep wooded hill overlooking the dirt road from where we had come from, and suddenly we heard another cracking branch from behind us. Whatever it was, it actually seemed to be following us. Our imaginations going wild, we came up with everything from a serial killer stalking us in the woods to deer to Bigfoot himself, and but when we got back to the campsite, we told her dad what we had heard, and how it seemed to be paralleling us. He kind of played it off as maybe a black bear and secured all the food. Later on, my friend confided in me that her dad had actually gotten out his pistol and would be sleeping with it that night. My friend and I were sharing one tent though, and he was in his own tent not far from us, so we figured everything was going to be okay. But I woke sometime in the middle of the night to uh, hearing something or someone walking outside of our tent. As I lay still, listening, I could hear it quietly circling the tent. It sounded like it was walking on two legs because it had this distinct rhythm in how it walked, and whatever it was, it sounded big as I could hear its weight, if that makes sense, as it put each foot down and walked. I could even hear relatively quiet but deep heavy breathing at times as well. As I lay there listening, I could hear it wandering to the other parts of the campsite and then back to our tent, almost as if it was walking in a big repetitive loop. This went on for who knows how long, to be honest. It felt like an eternity terrified and unable to wake my friend I just laid there listening until I eventually fell back to sleep the next morning I told my friend and her dad about it but I don't know if they believed me or not interestingly though absolutely nothing in the camp was disturbed in any way the ground wasn't very soft and in some places it was covered in grass so there were no footprints either but this is something that I've just never been able to explain and to this day it sort of lingers in the back of my mind when camping. I just always wonder what it was that walked around our tent all night. This took place in 2001 when I was dating my ex-wife. I was at her house in a small town in Indiana and decided to stay the night because it was late. She still lived with her parents, and they're old-fashioned, so I was made a bed on the couch in their living room. The couch was against the wall and positioned as such so that I could see down the hallway to my ex's bedroom. I began to drift off to sleep, and I must have woken up a little bit later and saw my ex standing outside of her bedroom, just sort of looking at me. She was wearing an old-fashioned white nightgown, which I thought was strange, but I didn't know what she wore to bed at that time. She walked down the hallway and stood next to me by the couch, but when she looked down at me, her face contorted and became sort of demonic looking, and then she reached out and started choking me. I then woke up and sat straight up gasping for air. I shook it off as a, a bad dream, and eventually I went back to sleep. But I woke up a second time to see her once again down the hallway by her door in the exact same nightgown. Once again, she came over to me and her face turned demonic and started choking me. I again woke up gasping for air. This time though, I just sort of sat there for a few, mulling it over in my mind. But finally, I decided that I just must be having a nightmare and that I should just probably go back to sleep. So I laid back down and again, this happened. But this time, she didn't appear normal. Just sort of demonic looking the whole time. And this last time that I woke up gasping for air, I ran to her room and woke her up and told her that I wasn't going back out to her living room because something was trying to kill me. She eventually calmed me down and I went to sleep in her room. The next day I described everything to her in detail and then she proceeds to tell me that a woman and her son 
He used to live there, but were killed in a car crash many, many years ago. She also tells me that her family has all seen a lady in a white nightgown and a small boy in the home. The family is Catholic, and they actually had the place cleansed before by a priest. But I can still see that demon's face in my memories, as clear as that night. So, I just want to start by saying that, to make this story easier to understand, I'm going to use a lot of dialogue. Obviously, this wasn't recorded, so these aren't the exact words of anyone involved in this experience. But I'm just trying to tell it as best as possible, and I think it'll benefit me and you if I use a lot of quotes. Just keep in mind, though, that most of it is not direct. This is going to be a bit long, too, so well, let's just get into it. So this happened in 2015 when I was 16 and still living in my hometown. A forgotten little beach town in the middle of nowhere that's so remote it's probably not even known by surrounding areas. Basically, there's three things that you can do there as a teenager though. Go to the movies, swim, or go to this pathetic little place called Miller's Fun Park. It's relatively similar to a lot of park type things, only a, a whole lot worse if I'm being honest. There's a terrible arcade with broken ski ball machines, batting cages that probably haven't been used since the early 80s, a pathetic mini golf course, and the most dangerous go-karts that you've probably ever seen in your life. Like, seriously. The Miller's Fun Park is on the edge of a field, though. On the opposite side of the field, about three miles down, I would say, is the beach. And across the single street are the woods. Now, if our town is pretty much in the middle of nowhere, Miller's must practically be on the moon. So my cousin Emma and I decided one summer night that we wanted to go go-kart. It was around 10pm, so we knew it would be almost deserted, but that was the way that we liked it anyway. So I picked her up from her house and we made the long drive down. Once we had arrived and parked in the nearly empty lot, we hopped out of the car and paid for some go-karting tickets. The same people had worked there forever, I swear to you as well. But there was no one except for a few boys in the arcade, and a guy who looked to be in his 60s, sitting on a bench near the batting cages. So Emma and I paid him no mind, and we went back to the go-kart track. Like I said too, these carts were incredibly dangerous, so I was completely focused on nothing but making sure I wasn't going to skid and flip as we raced way too fast around the windy track. And I think that this is why I didn't notice the guy walking over to the fence. And also why I didn't notice him watching us until we pulled into the lanes after our last lap. He was standing on the other side of the fence right where I was parked. He stared at me with the most unsettling expression and a really creepy smile playing on his cracked lips as his dark eyes gleamed. I managed to sort of uneasy smile back, handed another ticket to the guy running the go-karts, who was obviously higher than a kite at that time, and Emma and I went off again. But this time, I, I just couldn't focus, because this dude just gave me the worst type of feeling. But my eyes were constantly finding their way to the metal fence where he stood, unmoving and watching us every time that we were in his view. And the thing that was bothering me the most was that he had only bought three tickets, but we were on our second to last run, and he was standing directly next to the exit gate. I was uh, honestly just praying that he would move before we were done. But of course, no such luck. Our last go came and went, and I had no choice but to pull in next to him, unbuckle my seatbelt, and get out of my go-kart. I glanced over at Emma a few feet away as I opened the exit gate to see if she was as scared as I was. But she didn't even seem to notice as she bounced over and bragged about how she had beat me the last two times. I was barely listening though, and I just sort of opened the gate, and the guy stopped in front of me just as I was leaving. Hey there, he said. His voice was dry, and he smelled like cigarettes. What are you cute girls doing all alone here? My eyes darted over to Emma, who was looking at the dude with both confusion and annoyance. Uh, what? She said, pushing past the gate, so she stood beside me. Well, it's so late. 
His tone was as hungry as his eyes, and he reminded me of a snake for some reason. Do your parents know that you're out here? Yes, I answered quickly. They're waiting for us, actually. We need to get going. This was a lie, and probably sounded like it from my tone, but I tried to push past him anyway. It didn't work. He grabbed my shoulder, actually, to keep me in front of him. Nonsense. I saw you girls pull up alone. My heart dropped to my stomach. He had. Are you heading out? Why don't I walk you guys to your car? He starts inching towards me, and I look to Emma for help. With one swift movement, she pulled me halfway behind her and started sizing the guy up. This was pretty dumb, as we're both very small, and though she's a few inches taller than me, neither of us are anywhere near this guy's size. I mean, this guy was clearly 6'2 at least, but she doesn't seem to care. Actually, we're just headed to the arcade, she says harshly. Her boyfriend is going to meet us there. I did have a boyfriend at the time, but he wasn't coming. He wasn't even in town, in fact. I knew that she knew this as well. The guy's face immediately changes, though. His smile completely disappeared, and he was now glaring down at me with a look of annoyance in his eyes. I felt myself starting to cower. Boyfriend? He says roughly. Emma didn't give me time to say anything. She just grabbed my arm and tugged me behind her into the arcade. The boys from before had already left, unfortunately, and the usual girl who worked in there was nowhere to be found. Still, though, it felt safer than outside, so we ran to the back and hid behind the claw machine. What do we do? I left my phone in the car. I whisper shouted. There was no way that I was going out there alone at this stage, and the pothead go-kart guy had already disappeared into the small ticket shack as well. I don't have mine either. I left it charging, she said, face -pumping. We're just going to have to make a run for it, all right? Wait, are you crazy? He's probably waiting for us in the parking lot. Well, what about the guy who runs the go-karts? We could get him to walk us out, she said, and I just shook my head. Man, he's high as Mount Everest right now. I don't want to risk running all the way to the ticket stand for nothing. Well, then we don't have any choice. She stood up, pulling me with her. Let's go. I swallowed hard, wanting to cry. I had honestly never been that scared before up until that stage. And there was just something really wrong about this guy. We just knew it. We made our way out the arcade, looking around to see if he was nearby. But the park was now absolutely deserted. Emma practically had to drag me to the exit. I was looking every direction every second, waiting for this guy to come out of the woods or something and pounce on us at any second. But he didn't. In fact, everything was just sort of dead still. Get your keys out, Emma instructed, and I pulled them out from my pocket. We were about 20 feet from my car when... I stopped dead in my tracks. What? She whispered. I stared at the car, keys in hand, and I had never locked it. Emma, I never locked the car. What? I didn't lock it. And what if... I trailed off, but she knew what I was saying. She started inching towards the car, and I grabbed her arm to stop her, but she pulled away. I'm just going to peek, all right? If I say run, then you have to run. Her voice is quiet, but I nodded shakily. She eventually made it close enough to see inside, but by the way that she was squinting, I knew that it was way too dark to make anything out. My heart was beating out of my chest, and I mean, what if he wasn't there? What if he jumps out? Or what if we get in and he asphyxiates me like in the movies or something? All these thoughts almost drown out the unmistakable sound of shoes slamming against the pavement all of a sudden. Uh, my head whipped around instantly and there he was, sprinting at us at full speed out of the woods. I screamed bloody murder and broke for the car, jiggling the handle as I realized that I had locked it in fact. Emma was already on the other side, screaming at me to unlock it. I fumbled with the keys but managed not to drop them as I unlocked the door, flung it open and practically threw myself inside. I had just managed to close the door too when he was there, slamming his fist against the window and shouting incoherently. 
I was sobbing at this point and barely managed to lock the doors as he goes for the handle and yanks on it as hard as he can. Emma was screaming at me to go, 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 and through my tears I shoved the key into the ignition and just flew it into reverse. He was still chasing us as well and yelling at us as I veered backwards out of the lot and turned as fast as I could while slamming on the gas. Honestly, too, I was driving like I was still in that go-kart, but I didn't care. I could barely see the road through the flood of tears and Emma had to grab the wheel several times to keep us from crashing before I finally regained my composure. Though obviously shaken up, she managed to keep her tears in and be the sane one out of the two of us as we drove at least 30 miles over the speed limit the whole way back to my house. In the end, we didn't actually tell either of our parents about this as well, and looking back I truly wish that we had because there was something seriously wrong about that guy, but we were just sillily too scared of what they might say or do. I think that we may have thought at the time that they would blame us or something, so it just stayed a secret between us. Something that even we didn't talk about until months after the horrifying account. Safe to say though, we never went back to Miller's Fun Park after that. And I guess I'll finish with this. I just want to urge you guys to all be extremely careful if you're going out at night. Because you just truly never know who or what you may stumble upon. This incident happened to me over the Christmas holidays this past year and it just occurred to me that the sheer insanity of it may make it a good fit for here. For reference, I'm a 24 year old female. So my cousin and I decided to go up a few hours north for a nice winter cabin weekend. It went great, nothing creepy happened, but on our final day we packed up at about 6am and hopped in the car to get an early start on the 5 hour drive that we had ahead of us. It was a foggy morning, not actively snowing, but previous snowfalls had piled up quite a bit, making the driver a little bit riskier in the dark early hours of the morning. My cousin was driving and we were chatting and listening to podcasts, but not too aware of our surroundings. We were about maybe 20 minutes into the drive when, unfortunately, the car skidded off the road a little, damn the black ice, and we very slightly grazed a tree. We got out to take a look and, by some miracle, I don't even know how, there was no damage or anything on the car. As my cousin and I started to laugh with relief, we were just thanking our luck when I shielded my eyes because of some idiot with their crazy high beams coming up behind us. Ugh, so obnoxious, my cousin laughed, and starting to open her door to step back in, when... The blinding headlights car honks and continues to keep at it as they approached us. My cousin and I just sort of looked at each other, super confused, but we quickly hopped back into the car. The car begins to slow down and we're able to see a man in the driver's seat. And he finally takes his hand off the horn and pulls up right next to my cousin's car, which is really dumb because we were off-road and it was crazy slippery. But he rolls down his window and motions for my cousin to roll down ours. We figure it's fine because he's still inside of his car and we're in ours. I know, probably still a stupid move. But he says, Hey there ladies, in a rush this morning? He laughs. Uh, not really, uh, just trying to get home. Can we help you with something? My cousin replies, totally stone cold poker face. Oh, uh, no, I... I just noticed you dropped something about two kilometers back. It fell out of your trunk. My cousin turned to look at me. Did you shut the trunk when we left? Uh, yeah, dude, obviously, I replied. And knowing the way the car is shaped, we should have been able to definitely hear an open trunk. Oh, uh, but, well, th thank you, sir, but I think you might have had us mixed up with somebody else, maybe? My cousin said and immediately rolled up a window. It's hard to put my finger on it, but for some reason, this man just gave us really bad vibes. He starts blaring his horn again and motioning for us to roll down the window. My cousin rolls it down again and sees him holding up some women's underwear and smiling and says, See? This look familiar? 
I can literally remember the exact tone with which he said that. And we said, no thanks sir, you have a great day now. My cousin quickly rolled up her window again and floored it, quickly hopping back on the road and thankfully the man was either taken aback or just gave up and we didn't see him for the next hour or so. My cousin and I were both a little bit shaken, I'll admit, but we tried to just laugh it off since we were safe and hadn't seen his car following us or anything like that. But about two hours into our trip, we got off at an exit to fill up for gas and grab some breakfast at a Starbucks. My cousin and I mobile ordered and I was going to quickly run in and grab our food and drinks. It had started snowing at this point, and while the sun had been up for a little bit, it was still foggy and gloomy, making it hard to see the surroundings. But I ran in, and as I reached for our food, someone's arm reached over mine to grab a napkin, and I instantly flinched. When I looked up, I truly almost crapped myself, because it was that same man again. Despite him never getting out of his car, he did have his highlights on and I was able to get a clear view of his face. And it was definitely him. I was sure of that. Look at us, just like old friends. He smiled at me. I immediately looked down, grabbed my food and started walking out of the store. As I left, I heard him talking to the barista saying, See that beauty queen over there? That's my beauty queen. And I mean, what the heck, right? I almost had tears in my eyes because I was so terrified. I power walked back to the car, almost tripping outside because I was so scared, and I wasn't walking like a normal person. I hopped in and screamed, We need to get the hell out of here, back on the road. He's inside the Starbucks. My cousin started laughing, thinking that I was pranking her, but she quickly realized that that was not the case when the man walked out of the Starbucks a few seconds later, with no drink or food in hand, walking straight towards our car, waving at us. My cousin quickly started to turn the car on when the man reached into his pocket. I genuinely thought that he was about to pull out a weapon as well, holding up the underwear that he had before. Thankfully, my cousin took no time in backing out of there and speeding back onto the highway. We were both freaking out at this point, not sure how he ended up at the same stop as us, despite us not seeing him behind us at all at any point. I mean... He could have taken some sort of back roads that we didn't know about, sure, but it would have taken him so much longer than us to get there. Unless he'd been trailing behind us. I don't know, but we quickly tried to find an alternate route on our maps app, and thankfully there was one that made us go through some local roads, which we hoped might help. Of course, with our luck though, as we were going through a smaller town, I felt the car getting gradually lower on my side. So we pulled over at a well-lit gas station and realized that we were losing air in one of the tires. We were both too scared to get out, but figured that if we went out together that it might be less scary and also less risky. So we did. We filled up the tire with some air and it seemed to be okay. We got back in the car, back on our way. Everything seemed fine too until maybe 10 minutes later when... This car just seemed to appear out of nowhere and directly behind us. My cousin and I just looked at each other, having no idea what to do if it were the man. And our suspicions were confirmed when he blared his stupid horn yet again, then quickly swerved off the road to get right next to us. What the heck, right? But this time, he was on my side. He had his window rolled down and he was screaming at us, at this point though, I didn't care at all and I called my brother-in-law who was a cop. I know, I know, I probably should have called the police directly. It was a stupid move on my part, but in the moment I was just trying to justify this as being not that serious. But my brother-in-law told us to drive directly to the nearest police station and to call them right away so that they would be alerted. And literally, as he was instructing me, the creep just braked his car just stopped on the side of the snowy icy road. We were still speeding away though, so it quickly got harder and harder to see him, but from what I could make out, he had gotten out of his car and was now just sitting on the hood. Just sitting there, watching us in this freezing, snowing weather. 
My cousin and I didn't want to stop or do anything with about an hour left in the journey, so we decided to just book it straight back home, and thankfully, that was the end of it. Now, I know we made a lot of stupid mistakes that could have potentially had horrible consequences, but I'm super happy that we made it out alive and unharmed. I still don't know how he caught up to us seemingly magically like that and why he just sat there at the end, but I honestly think that I don't even want to find out.